Yeah, I think Mark, you can go ahead and, okay. So uh, welcome everyone uh, to the One World uh, Mind Seminar, um, where it is our great pleasure to have uh, Anna Little as our speaker. Uh, Anna received her PhD uh, from Duke University in 2011, uh, where she worked under Mara Maggioni uh, and studied uh, intrinsic dimension estimation methods uh, for high dimensional data. From 2012 to 2017, Anna was an assistant professor of ma mathematics at Jacksonville University, um, where uh, in addition to teaching and research, she also served as a statistical consultant. Starting in 2018, she began a research postdoctoral position uh, at Michigan State University in the Department of Computational Mathematics, Science and Engineering, um, where I've had the pleasure to work with Anna uh, and Anna has also worked with uh, Professor uh, Yu Ying Xia as well uh, on methods for statistical and geometric analysis of high dimensional data, uh, some of which she'll, she'll talk about today. Um, recently, Anna accepted a tenure track position uh, in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Utah, and she'll begin there uh, very shortly, uh, starting in January of 2021. Uh, the title of Anna's talk today is Clustering High Dimensional Data with Path Metrics, A Balance of Density and Geometry. Uh, Anna, it's a great pleasure to have you here for the MIND seminar, and we are looking forward to your talk. Thanks a lot, Matt, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here and um, just wanted to say from the beginning, feel free to uh, interrupt with any questions that you may have along the way. I'm, I'm happy to answer questions and be interrupted. Okay, um, so I'm going to be talking about clustering today um, from a few different perspectives. And so the goal in clustering is we're all familiar with is to partition data points into groups so that points in the same group are similar and points in different groups are not similar. Uh, so this is uh, easy to describe, but a lot of things about this procedure are unclear. What does it mean to be similar? How many groups should you use? What type of partitioning algorithm should you use? Uh, lots of options out there, including k-means and its variants, uh, density-based methods, graph-based and spectral methods. Um, and there are lots of interesting questions uh, that arise, is the partitioning reliable when the data dimension is large? Um, the high dimensional cases is always quite interesting. Um, and one of the questions about clustering that I'm going to focus on in this talk is uh, the trade-off, the balance between density and geometry. And there's usually a fundamental tension between methods which cluster based on density and methods which cluster based on uh, geometry. And there's really no right answer. Of course, this just depends on your data, depends on your application. Uh, so like you see in the data set on the left, um, you have two clusters that have very good geometric separation, but no density separation. And on the right, you have these sort of three interlocking, uh, interlaced rings, which have um, very good density separation, but uh, the means of all of those clusters are actually very close together. So in that sense, the geometric separation is, is poor. Okay, so um, I'm going to give kind of an overview of a few of the different uh, research projects I've worked on that are related to this. Um, so first of all, uh, pathmetric spectral clustering. This is a method which really emphasizes uh, the density in the data. So um, here we use a data-driven density-based metric and combined with graph-based clustering. And I'll discuss uh, the nice theoretical guarantees you can get, uh, some fast algorithms and the blessing of dimensionality. Um, and the second part of the talk, I'll uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about clustering with multidimensional scaling. So this is a method that really emphasizes preserving the geometry in the data. And specifically, I'll talk about the question of, can we exactly recover communities by clustering the MDS embedding? And we'll see that things get a little problematic in high dimensions, um, and you sort of suffer from the curse of dimensionality with this classic method. And so then in the last part of the talk, 
Um, I'll be talking about some of the newer work that I've been working on more recently, which is clustering with general path metrics. And, and this is a way that you can balance uh, density and geometry considerations in your data. And you have this critical parameter that controls the balance between these two factors. And so I'll discuss a few things related to this uh, convergence computation applications. Okay, so first of all, just a little bit of notation um, to be used fairly, fairly consistently throughout the talk. So uh, we have n data points in our sample size, x1 through xn, and k will be the number of clusters. Um, and then in i is the sample size of cluster i. And then a uh, little d will be the intrinsic dimension and big D will be the ambient dimension of the data. Okay, so um, for the robust pathmetric spectral clustering, this is joint work with uh, Mario Maggioni at Johns Hopkins and James Murphy at Tufts. Okay, and so the key question we answer here is what type of metric will view points connected by high density regions as close even if they are far apart um, in terms of Euclidean or even geodesic distance. Okay, so we would like, for example, if we have a point on the left side of the ring, we want a metric that says it's close to a point on the right side of the outer ring. And so one thing that you can use is um, what we referred to as the longest leg path distance or LLPB for short. And so this is a metric that's determined by the best path uh, through a data set. So the LLPD between two points xi and xj is um, determined by taking the minimum over all paths connecting the two points in a data set and um, taking the, the maximal edge of that path. So it's like the, the worst edge on the best path connecting the two points. And so you can see if I want to calculate the LLPD from the point here on the left of the moon to a point here on the right of the moon, I find this, this path which, which stays in high density regions and the, the, the length of the metric is just the length of this longest edge which looks to be there at the end. Okay, and this is just for visualization. You can now see if you have a data point here in the middle ring, it's actually close in LLPD to all of the points in this middle ring and far away from all of the other data points in the inner and outer ring. On the other hand, if you take a point here in the outer ring and you just look at the Euclidean distance to all of the other points in the data, you really don't see any correlation between Euclidean distance and this clustering structure. Okay, so couple of properties of LLPD. So it's a data dependent metric. It's never computed in a vacuum. It always depends on, um, yeah, the data set in which points live and it's all about density. And so one advantage of this approach is that it's robust to irregularly shaped clusters. So you can have any kind of weird elongation, that's not a problem. And, but a few potential disadvantages are um, sensitivity to outliers since this metric is based on best paths through the data, um, you know, a, a few points can make a big difference and a potentially high computational cost. Um, there's actually a nice way around that, which I'll discuss kind of at the end of the section. Okay, and so clustering with LLPD uh, clearly has very close connections with single linkage clustering, um, as you might guess, just from the definition of the metric, but I'm actually going to be talking about combining um, LLPD with spectral clustering um, because that yields uh, some very nice theoretical guarantees. Okay, so if you haven't seen spectral clustering before, here's the, the quick one slide recap. Um, everything you need to know in one slide. So, um, so yeah, so you start with your n data points, x1 through xn, and then the basic idea is that you build a graph on the data and you define your edge weights. So WIJ is the weight between XI and XJ. And it's generally some function of the distance between the two points 
and some scale parameter uh, sigma, which is quite important. Okay, so you take your, your edge weights and you calculate the degree of all of your points. And then you use your weights and your degrees to form a graph Laplacian. Um, there's different normalizations here that you can use. Um, in, in this talk, I'll talk about the symmetric graph Laplacian, which is defined in the following way. Okay, and so once you have your graph Laplacian, you do an eigen decomposition and you use the k bottom eigenvectors of the graph Laplacian to map the data from Rd, from some high dimensional space, to Rk, um, a low dimensional space. And then you just apply usually a more traditional clustering algorithm such as k-means um, in that uh, low dimensional space to the what would be referred to as the, the spectral embedding of the data. Okay, so we want to sort of analyze this spectral clustering procedure uh, when we apply it with LLPD uh, instead of Euclidean distance as the underlying metric. And we want to consider it under, uh, so we want to take a, a simple data model just to uh, kind of illustrate some, some key points here. So um, I'm going to assume that I have K cluster sets, X1 through XK of dimension little d that are separated by uh, a Euclidean distance, at least delta. And I, all of these cluster sets are living inside some ambient noise set, which I'll call X tilde. And then just to keep things simple, we can assume, for example, that we sample Ni points uniformly from cluster set Xi and N tilde points uniformly from uh, the noise set X tilde. So, the basic idea is we have high density on the cluster sets, low density on the noise set. Um, okay, so to address the first potential issue that may arise um, if you want to work with this metric, um, it's important to denoise your data. So um, we applied a pretty uh, simple uh, KNN based procedure. So this is what I should say KNN LLPD based denoising procedure. Um, and so we remove any data point xi whose kth nearest neighbor LLPD exceeds some threshold beta. Uh, so you can understand this probably pretty easily from these pictures. So if you start off with this noisy data set, um, you compute each point's um, kth nearest neighbor LLPD, you know, sort those distances and you get sort of this nice elbow plot here and then you can just, you know, truncate the top of the elbow and remove those points to denoise the data. Okay. So if we apply this denoising procedure with parameters k and theta, and then we just apply standard spectral clustering, but replace Euclidean distance with LLPD, you can actually show that two really nice things happen. Um, so, well, sorry, if these conditions, and if these conditions are satisfied, so you have two conditions, one is a, a condition on the denoising parameter, theta, and the second is a condition on the scale parameter, sigma, which is used to construct the weights, but if these two conditions are satisfied, then two nice things happen, and the first is that the largest gap in the eigenvalues of the Laplacian is lambda k plus one minus lambda k with high probability, why do we care about that? Well, that means that we could detect how many clusters we have from the maximal eigengap, which is a heuristic that, that people use a lot, but this proves um, in, which, in which scenarios that would work. And, and then secondly, clustering using k-principal eigenvectors of the Laplacian achieves perfect labeling accuracy with high probability. Okay, and so we sort of see this method um, we see the blessing of dimensionality here because the method really benefits a lot uh, from an intrinsic dimension much smaller than the ambient dimension. Actually, things get better and better as the ambient dimension increases because that just makes the noise points even further apart. So uh, when the ambient dimension is quite small relative 
sorry, yeah, when the intrinsic dimension is quite small relative to the ambient dimension, you can tolerate a very large number of noise points. So you can take a number of noise points, essentially exponential in your number of cluster points uh, with an exponent of big D over little d. And this means that there, if you look back at the theorem, that there becomes a very large range of scales, both for the denoising parameter and for the scale parameter where LLPV spectral clustering succeeds. So the method becomes um, robust in that sense. Okay, and to actually prove that it's true, uh, there's basically two main parts to the analysis. Uh, part one is analyzing the finite sample behavior of LLPD under uh, the random data model. And here um, we use ideas from percolation theory to sort of analyze the behavior of the metric. And then part two uses deterministic matrix perturbation theory um, and the properties of the metric to control the spectral decomposition of the Laplace. Okay, so here you can kind of visualize um, the procedure on a toy data set where you have sort of an elongated cluster structure. What you see in the top row is what you would get from standard spectral clustering. You would start off with this data set. Here's your spectral embedding. And what you see colored, the colors correspond to uh, the output of k-means when you cluster the spectral embedding. So you can see that it's not working so well here because of the elongation. And you also see, if you look at how the eigenvalues of the graph Laplacian grow as a function of the scale parameter sigma, um, you don't see real clear separation in the eigenvalues. On the other hand, if you take that same data set and you compute LLPD, and then you do a spectral embedding, um, these, these elongated clusters essentially collapse down to a single point. So you have very good separation in the spectral embedding. Um, and you can also see in the eigenvalue plots, as you increase the scale parameter, very good separation between the fourth and the fifth eigenvalue curves, which helps infer how many clusters you have in the data. OK, and I will say, though, this does come at a price. Um, because if you look at the spectral embedding, it's nice that it's collapsed these elongated things down to a point, but we've also lost all of that information, right? So if we were interested in that geometry, now it's gone. Okay. Um, and then in terms of the computational side, um, so you may be concerned that computing the minimum over all paths connecting two points in the data set is not a nice computational problem, but um, it turns out that you can approximate this um, metric pretty quickly uh, using a sequence of multi-scale graphs. So if you want to compute the LLPD between all of your, all pairs of your data points um, in some graph, you can make a sequence of, um, increasing of graphs which keep more and more edges. And um, I won't go into too many details here, but basically it reduces to just computing connected components um, at each of these graphs. Uh, and that is pretty cheap to do. And so at the end of the day, you can get um, an eigen decomposition for the Laplacian, which is order n log n. So essentially uh, linear in the sample size, which is very nice. Okay, so just to summarize this part um, on LLPD spectral clustering. So we look at a density-based metric, which is combined with spectral clustering for strong theoretical guarantees. Uh, the method really benefits from um, the, having an intrinsic dimension uh, much smaller than the ambient dimension. And there's an, uh, an approximation procedure which gives an order n log n implementation algorithm. OK, and as we pointed out, the benefit here is the method is very robust for irregularly shaped clusters, but it does require very good density separation. So if you have clusters that kind of run into each other, then things will go, go poorly. Um, so if you're interested, you can check out our 2020 GMLR paper 
And we also have code um, that implements the procedure. Um, uh, I, uh, oh, yeah, I think uh, there's a question for you, Anna, in the chat. Um, do you want to look at it yourself? Or you want me to read it for you? Do you mind reading it? Not at all. Um, okay. So Renee Vidal asks uh, a few questions, actually. Um, one, uh, what is N tilde and N min? Two, how broad is the range for theta? And three, how can one use the theorem to set theta? Um, OK, so I can repeat those as yeah, I yes, <laughs> repeat the first one. Yeah, the first okay. one was about uh, uh, n tilde and n min. Yeah, yeah. so sorry, I, I think I went a, a little fast. So n tilde is the number of no noise points. Let me go back to the picture of the model. So here's, here's the model, right? n tilde is the number of points that fall in the white box. And then n min, which I, I didn't say specifically what it was, but it's the, it's the minimal number of um, sample points you get in one of the cluster sets. So we will have an n1 points in x1, n2 points in x2, and n min will be, you know, the smaller of those numbers. Okay, so, so that was the... That was the first one. Um, the second, the second and third were about the theta, um, I think on the previous slide. Yep. Yeah. Uh, how broad is the range of theta? Um, and then also how can one use the theorem to set theta? Right. So, 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 so great question. Um, you know, how broad the range for theta is really depends on how large, you know, little d is compared to, to big D. And so, um, and, and basically it just boils down to thinking about how far away are you from your neighbors? If you're in a d-dimensional set, the distance to your, you know, neighbors will be about uh, one over n to the one over d. And so, inside a cluster set, this distance is quite small. Um, but if you if you are in the noise set and you think about how far away you are from a neighbor because you're in high dimensions, it's a, it's a, it's a very large distance. And so this becomes, um, this becomes quite large as capital D increases. So that's why actually having capital D large is helpful because it makes this range a, a really big range. Um, and you can see the denoising, uh, the denoising K comes in here too. So uh, it, it, it's, it's helpful to do noise based on, say, your distance to your 10th nearest neighbor or your 20th nearest neighbor, as opposed to your first nearest neighbor, because that will also uh, make this a bigger range of values. I think if I said that correctly. Um, okay, and then how do you use the um, how do you use the theorem to choose the theta? is is a very good question. And um, I don't know that I have a, a great answer for that one. I think in practice, you probably use, you know, an empirical sort of heuristic to choose the theta. Um, but, the, but this is, but the theorem sort of, you know, supports, I think that that's a reasonable thing to do and sort of studies the effect of how the intrinsic and ambient dimension play into these considerations. Perfect. Uh, thanks, Anna. Actually, we have a couple more questions, if, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, these are from Alexander Litvinenko. Um, the first question is, is a low rank approximation of the graph Laplacian important here? And wow. perhaps, oh, yeah, go ahead. Why don't you answer that? And then there's a, some, a, a bit of a follow up. Go ahead with that one first. Yeah, OK. So, so great. So great question. Um, in terms of the, uh, yeah, so, so what tends to happen when you're computing this metric is that, um, is that you tend to naturally kind of get a low rank structure in your Laplacian, much more so than you would if you just had Euclidean distances. And that's because 
you know, if you have like a certain region of your data up here and another region down here, there's probably like a best path that connects them. And so, so they're, so probably you have these, these large block constant regions of the Laplacian. So it's not that you get a bunch of zeros in the Laplacian, but it, it's that you can organize it in such a way that you get very large block constant regions in your Laplacian. And so if you, if you take, you know, that, but that is a low rank structure. If you take that into account and, you know, keep track of that, then you can define, you know, fast rule for matrix multiplication and you can, you know, really get the, the fast computation. Great, thank you. And then uh, another question from uh, Alexander is, did you try any other choices for the matrix W, the, the weight matrix? Um, so other choices in terms of like not using a Gaussian kernel, for example, I guess I'm not. I suppose that's, that's part of the question. Um, um, Alexander, if you want to chime in with any additional Uh, Mattern type. Good evening. Okay. Uh, Alexander is here. Uh, thank you very much for a nice talk and for your answers. I mean, for example, Mattern type and not infinity norm, but Euclidean norm for matrix uh, V, V. Uh, so, like computing W with like other metrics other than like. Yes, you took Gaussian or exponential, but. <laughs> maybe of matern type or maybe mm -hmm. uh, some other types i don't know yeah we we didn't explore that extensively to be honest yeah we 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 didn't we didn't try uh, a, a lot of different kernels so i think we were more focused on sort of the properties of the metric itself um but yeah i think yeah you could change you could use a different kernel it, for simplicity i stated the theorem with the gaussian kernel but it, it doesn't have to be you know that th this does not have to be a Gaussian kernel. It could be a, yeah. Okay. Yes, thank okay. You. okay. Uh, shall I move on? Yeah. Thank you, Anna. I think you can okay. move on. Thank you. No problem. It's nice that people are listening. The last talk I gave, I did. Nobody asked one question, so it, that it's hard to tell. If, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I have another question. Um, you know, there are, you can find some data online. I think it's called UCI or this open open database uh, with all kinds of sure. multi uh, machine learning data to test your algorithms. Did you try it? Oh, yes, we did. Yeah. So that's in the paper if you want to check. But it worked again? especially well on a number of like image data sets, uh, mm -hmm. you know, like, like COIL and uh, yeah, things like that. Uh, can you please show again link reference to your paper? Oh, e let's see. I don't. I'm sorry. I didn't have the 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 link there. But yeah, uh, maybe Matt can type it in the chat. Or, sure. Or there you go. Yep. I'll do that. I just typed it there. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay. So um, okay. So moving on to part. Two then, I think that kind of wraps up the first part. Um, wanted to shift gears a little bit and talk about um, clustering with multidimensional scaling. So I, you've probably heard of multidimensional scaling. It's been around for a while and it's a very popular method. Um, what is multidimensional scaling or MDS for short? Um, MDS defines a low dimensional embedding which preserves, um, which approximately preserves pairwise distances. So. It's a dimension, linear dimension reduction method, which uh, tries to preserve pair, which preserves pairwise distances as well as possible in a small number of dimensions. Um, what's, what's really nice about this procedure is that you don't actually need geometric coordinates for you, your data. You just need some way of measuring distances or correlations between your data points, but you don't actually have to have coordinates uh, which has made it quite popular in, in certain disciplines where this is difficult. Um, and MDS uh, preserves global geometry, which is a very nice property that even a lot of um, more 
sophisticated dimension reduction um, methods like UMAP and TISNI uh, fail to do this. And it's useful for data visualization and clustering in manifold learning. Um, however, uh, despite the fact that it's, it's used so frequently, uh, theoretical guarantees characterizing its performance under random, randomness are, are rather lacking from the literature. So we were seeking to try to fill this hole a little bit. And so here's um, MDS in one slide after spectral clustering in one slide. And I should say that I'll be talking about the simplest um, version of MDS, for, which is classical multidimensional scaling. OK, and so for this algorithm, all you have to do is input uh, a distance matrix. So if you have a matrix of your square distances, D, you take that matrix D, you apply double centering, and you obtain your MDS matrix B. You then compute an eigen decomposition of B. And um, lambda here will denote the top eigenvalues of B, top R eigenvalues, and V will denote the corresponding top eigenvectors of B. Um, you do have to specify your embedding dimension R, but once you specify that, then the MDS embedding is given by the rows of V lambda to the one half. So just like we had before for spectral clustering, we have the eigenvectors of this matrix defining our embedding, but here the eigenvectors are scaled by the square root of the eigenvalues. So that part's a little different. Okay, and if your distances are Euclidean and um, you're, you have empirically centered data, then this MDS matrix B is simply an inner product matrix. So you can have this in your mind, this Bij is just the inner product between Xi and Xj. Okay, so just to illustrate this, um, so you can just you know see a picture of the method of the method. This is the TCGA pan cancer data set from UC Santa Cruz, and it consists of about three thousand cancer patients and four different cancer types: um, breast, kidney, lung, thyroid, and you have over twenty thousand genomic features for each patient. But even in two dimensions, uh, you see you really see the you know distinct separation between the cluster types. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. Okay, so um, from a mathematical perspective, uh, we looked at the problem of exact cluster recovery with MDS in a mixture model. So the data model here that I'll be talking about is when I have a, a mixture of Gaussians. So let's say I have K Gaussian distributions and from each one, I have NI independent, independent samples. Uh, mu I will be the mean of the ith cluster. And let's say they have covariance matrix sigma. And then once again, N will be the total sample size when I add all of those things together. OK, and so the question that I want to talk about is when does clustering the MBS embedding exactly recover the clusters with high probability um, or another way to phrase this, which I'll clarify on the next slide, is when is the MDS embedding a perfect geometric representation um, of the underlying labels? Okay, and I will say that uh, our, our theoretical results do hold more generally. So they hold for general sub-Gaussian distributions. They don't have to be Gaussian distributions. And also non-identically distributed errors. You don't have to have the same covariance matrix in each cluster or even you know, they, 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 they could all be different. But to keep things simple, I just thought I'd state it as simply as possible in this talk. Okay, so what do I mean by uh, a perfect geometric representation? Um, I just mean that the maximal within cluster distance is smaller than half of the minimal between cluster distance. So this is actually a very strong condition, which essentially guarantees that, you know, any distance-based clustering um, algorithm will essentially uh, cluster the data correctly. So by reducing to this condition, it's a very strong condition and it guarantees that many algorithms can exactly recover the underlying labels with high probability. Okay, so this work is 
is actually related to kind of two main areas in the literature. First of all, exact recovery for stochastic block models. Um, and the key difference here is that um, in, in, in our setup, we have a similarity matrix with dependent edges, uh, while for SVMs, um, you, you assume independence of, of all the edges. And it's also related to exact recovery for a mixture of Gaussians and uh, a, a number of references there that may be relevant or of interest. Whoops. Okay. So to answer this question, we want to uh, quantify basically the difficulty of the clustering problem. Um, and so we do this in the following way by, de by defining the, the signal to noise ratio. So we measure the strength of the noise by sigma max squared, which is the largest eigenvalue of the covariance matrix. And then we measure the strength of the signal or the community separation by mu diff, which is the, the minimum distance between cluster, cluster means. And then um, define the signal to noise ratio as mu diff squared over sigma max squared. So this is basically a measure of you know, geometric separation divided by scatter. And so you can see, for example, on the TCGA pan cancer data set, if you take you know, three very distinct cancer types. Um, they're distinct in the plot and the SNR is like 16. If you take three very similar cancer types, you know, you have a lot more um, overlap, a lot more uh, in the scatter and the SNR is a lot lower, 4.5. So this is sort of an, a natural metric to, to think about. Okay, and then we analyze um, the problem using an additive model. So we're going in matrix notation, we'll just decompose the data X into two parts, the underlying means of the data points. So this matrix will only have K distinct rows corresponding to those K different means and then uh, noise. And then um, X tilde will be the empirically centered data and so we can think about the ideal MDS matrix, MM transpose, uh, which defines the ideal MDS embedding V lambda to the one half. But of course, we don't have access to that. We only have access to the noisy version, X tilde, X tilde transpose, um, which defines the noisy MDS embedding with the same notation, but with the tildes on top. So V tilde, lambda tilde to the one half. Okay, um, and so the basic idea here is that um, clustering the ideal embedding trivially recovers your clusters because all of those, you know, K different rows just map to um, K distinct uh, data points in the spectral embedding. And so that trivially recovers your clusters. So if you can control with high probability uh, the perturbation of the MDS embedding under the max norm, um, where R is any rotation matrix, rotating the data won't, won't matter, then we can exactly recover the clusters by clustering the noisy embedding instead of the ideal one. And there's basically three steps to the analysis. So first, controlling the eigenspace perturbation. Um, secondly, controlling the embedding perturbation. So we don't just want to look at the per perturbation in the eigenvectors, but we want to take into account that they have been rescaled by the square root of the eigenvalues. Uh, and then finally, sort of use, utilizing this guarantee on the embedding perturbation to derive conditions on the signal to noise ratio, which guarantee exact recovery. Okay, and I, and I, I won't go into details here, but I'll just comment that, um, you know, sort of key for this whole analysis is um, controlling this eigenspace perturbation, and we uh, utilize some new results in entry-wise perturbation theory, which really leverage the low coherence of the eigenvectors of MM transpose. So when you when, when those eigenvectors have low coherence, you can get some some nice bounds, which are um, much sharper than you would get otherwise. 
Okay, and then at the end of the day, um, this is sort of a summary theorem. So probability at least uh, one minus one over n clustering the rank R CMDS embedding perfectly recovers the labels whenever the signal to noise ratio is lower bounded by the square root of D log n plus D over n. And so it's kind of helpful to think about breaking this result up into different sub regimes when we think about um, the dimension being small or the dimension being moderate or the dimension being large. And so in the low dimensional regime, um, you know, so D is order one, essentially you get a log n scaling for the SNR that's required. In the moderate D dimension, um, essentially you need it to scale like a square root of D. And then in the high dimensional regime, you know, the second term really becomes dominant and you need um, the SNR to scale like the ratio D over N. Okay, so here are a few simulations testing if these bounds are sharp. Um, so this one here on the left, we target the low D regime and we fix, um, we fix a small dimension in the very N and the signal to noise ratio, and then try to kind of, um, you know, estimate where the boundary between exact recover and exact recovery and failure of exact recovery occurs. And you can see um, this pink line has a slope of one, which actually, and this is a log log n versus log SNR plot. So this indicates that having a lower bound, you know, having the SNR bounded, lower bounded by log n is in fact sharp. And um, this is the same criteria that you would get for stochastic block models. Um, you, you can't do better than that. In the moderate D regime, so this simulation over here is targeting the moderate D in the high dimensional regime. And so here, this boundary line starts off with a slope of a half, which indicates the square root of D scaling for the moderate D regime is sharp. And then it's interesting, you can see it start to steepen um, and we don't see it steepen all the way to a slope of one, but the, steepen the steepening seems to indicate that this um, lower bound that's linear in D um, is potentially sharp. Okay, and so um, some comments for the high, high dimensional case. Um, actually, it, it, it becomes difficult as the dimension gets large, the eigenvalues that you compute become inflated by noise. And so even when you can accurately estimate the eigenvectors, determining the correct rescaling uh, becomes problematic. And so this sort of motivates um, that the method would really benefit from robust unbiasing procedures applied to the eigenvalues. Um, and we investigated that uh, in, in, in some simulations. So this was the simulation I showed you before, but if you apply even a simple unbiasing procedure to the eigenvalues where you just subtract the trace of the covariance matrix, you can see that actually that square root of D scaling continues into the high dimensional regimes. So you get a much less uh, restrictive condition. Um, and I will say this is, this is not like a really clever way to do this, you know, to do this really well, you need to take into account your distributions and all that. But this is just sort of motivating that in high dimensions, the method is challenging and um, can benefit from this type of unbiasing procedure. Okay, so to sort of wrap up here, um, so uh, MDS preserves global geometry. That's a very nice feature of the method. We analyze when MDS followed by clustering exactly recovers labels for a random mixture model. And we, we do see, uh, in contrast to the first part of the talk, uh, the curse of dimensionality coming into play where scaling conditions become increasingly restrictive as the dimension increases. And just to emphasize, in order to put it into the framework of the talk, um, just like you know, the first part required, the model required good density separation, and the second part, uh, the model requires good geometric separation, 
Uh, so for example, it would not apply to the data set consisting of those three rings. In that case, mu diff is zero and, and we don't get anything. Um, but we have a, a, a preprint on this. We're still working on the final version, um, but if you're interested, maybe I'll pause there and just see if there are any questions on that before moving on, or am I good? Uh, there's nothing in the chat yet, okay, Anna, but uh, of course, folks can also unmute themselves if they'd like. Okay, I'll, I'll move on then. I just thought I'd okay. check. Okay. Okay, since I don't have a ton of time left, <laughs> I'll move on to the last part, uh, which is uh, because this is, I think, sort of important for the, the way I sold the talk, which was this balance of density and geometry. Um, this, so this is clustering with general path metrics, and this is joint work uh, with a, a number of people. So Yu Ying and Adriana, we've been working more on the applied side for um, utilizing this method with RNA data. And then um, James and Daniel, we've looked more at the theoretical side. Um, I'll discuss more specifically uh, in a few slides. Okay, so, so the question here that we wanna ask is can we obtain better clustering performance on real data by balancing density and geometry. And so um, the, the method that we look at is based on a generalization of the metric that I started the talk with. So this is the P power weighted path distance um, or LP. So you compute the the peak power weighted path distance between two data points xi and xj by once again taking the minimum over all paths connecting two points in um, a data set. But the way you measure the length of a path is different. Instead of just looking at the longest edge, um, you basically look at the, at the peak norm of a vector constructed from the edge weights. So each edge is raised to the p power, add them all up, and then raise it to the one over p. Okay, and so you can see as you take p larger and larger, what happens is that you know, this quantity will um, converge to the length of that longest edge. So that gives you the p infinity case, which is LLPD. And that's where um, the metric is, is all about the density in the data. If P is one, then you're measuring the length of these paths just by adding up the length of all of the edges. So this is like geodesic distance, which is all about geometry. Um, but if you choose a moderate P, so some P kind of in the middle, uh, it, it's a mix. So it's a mix of the, of the density and the geometry in the data. Okay. so. Um, so for P small, the density has little impact and best paths are short. For large P, the density has a strong impact and best paths may be long. So you can see here in this figure, um, if I'm going from this data point here on the left to the right, and I have a, an optimal path for my P of 1.1, I'm going to take a very direct path. On the other hand, if I'm going you know, from the left to the right with the P of two, once again, I'm going to um, stick to this high density region to get there. And so this choice of P balances the, the density and geometry. And so you may wonder, is there, so clearly the density has an effect on the metric. Is there a precise relationship between this discrete metric and the continuous density which generated the data? And it turns out um, there is, so there's actually a, a really, really nice continuous limit that you get as n goes to infinity. So if you have um, some density function f on a d-dimensional Ramanian manifold, uh, and you sample endpoints from the manifold according to the density function, so this is the result due to Huang, Damlin, and Hero in 2012. So they showed that as n goes to infinity, if you take your discrete path metric and you renormalize it appropriately, it converges to a continuous limit. And the continuous version of the metric is here as defined at the, at the bottom of the slide. So, um, 
script LP, the continuous P power weighted path distance, is given by taking the infimome over all paths along the manifold connecting the two points. And then how do you measure the length of the path? Um, once again, you can kind of see, but here it really makes the dependence on the density explicit. Um, you, you measure the length of the path um, according to the density and then also according to the length. Okay. Um, so, uh, so a natural question to ask is how fast does LP converge? Uh, how fast does the discrete metric converge to its continuous limit? Um, and I'll just say that to, to analyze this, uh, there's lots of results in Euclidean first passage percolation, which are uh, very relevant. And um, I'll go through this quickly since we're sort of getting, getting to the end of the time. Um, but if we, if we consider um, script LP, uh, sorry, the tilde LP as our appropriately normalized discrete metric and this um, tilde LP as the appropriately normalized continuous metric, uh, we can analyze the convergence rate by decomposing the mean squared error into two parts, sort of a standard bias and variance decomposition and there's strong evidence actually that the variance dominates the bias. And so if you can control the, the variance, this will really control the convergence rate of the discrete metric. And so uh, the convergence rate um, is then, yeah, driven by the variance, which is order n to the minus two times one minus chi over d, where chi is a density dependent constant. Um, which is bounded between zero and half. It's known as the fluctuation exponent. So in summary, what do you know? You know it's at worst n to the minus one over d and at best n to the minus two over d. Um, so that's not real fast. So that is something to be aware of. Um, when using this metric, it may be beneficial to first do dimension reduction uh, and then compute the metric which is actually what we do in, in, in this uh, application for RNA data. So I just wanted to sh show, um, to illustrate that actually this, this balance of density and geometry appears to be quite helpful um, for the RNA data that we've looked at. And here are just a handful of, of data sets and looking at the adjusted RAND index of clustering these data sets for two different p values, a p of two and a p of 1.5, and also comparing with Surat, which is pretty much state of the art for clustering RNA data right now. Um, and you can see that this uh, performs very well with a, with a p of two. And um, I will say that uh, clustering accuracy, however, even though that's what I've been talking about in this talk primarily, is not the only thing we care about. We also care about preserving the global geometry in the data uh, because you, know, you may be interested in how different cell types relate to each other, or you may be interested in um, you know, the evolution of cell types and seeing the, the, the relationship among the clusters is quite important. And so um, here's an example from a recent um, RNA benchmarking data set that appeared um, in Nature where they created a, a, a data set that was a, a mixture of uh, our, uh, I guess it's sort of synthetically created. They took these different, um, these different, uh, they, they mixed together RNA in different uh, amounts. So they, they know that because they created the data set that this sort of triangle really corresponds to the global geometry. And you can see that this structure, which is known to, to be true for this data, um, is preserved by the path metric embedding. But you know, other methods like UMAP and TISME sort of lose this global configuration. OK. Um, OK, so that's sort of motivating um, why we care. Um, and, but of course, a very important question in practice is can we compute it? Um, is this just going to be too expensive to be 
feasible for large data sets. Um, it, if you want to keep um, more of this geometric information, it, it is more expensive than computing LLPD. I don't, I don't think there's a way around that, um, but, you can, but you can make it cheaper. So in general, um, if you're computing path distances between all pairs of points, the complexity will scale like number of nodes times number of edges. Um, so in a complete graph, that's order in cubed. And, but you can make it faster by doing the computation in a sparse graph. So if you restrict to a K and N graph, you can improve your uh, complexity to quadratic. So one important question that we looked at was, when can you do this? When can you restrict to a sparse graph and still exactly recover the metric? And um, so this is a uh, work with uh, McKenzie and Murphy saying, um, so in the same manifold context that I described previously, previously, if you take a number of nearest neighbors, um, basically scaling like log n with the constants depending on the curvature, the discrepancies in the density, uh, the p, and also the dimensions, so all of those things come into play, uh, then you can compute this path metric without error from the KNN graph with high probability. Okay, so I think, I think maybe I'll skip that in the interest of time. The dimension is important, you know that. And I'll skip, I'll skip also this too. We have an application of estimating the convergence rate empirically by um, computing the variance in these sparse graphs, which is interesting to people who care about percolation. So. Okay, but let me wrap up um, so that maybe there's time for questions. If anybody has questions, uh, this talk illustrates the tension between density and geometry and clustering and the, these general path metrics provide a nice balance um, and exhibit competitive performance on RNA data. The dimension as always is very important um, you know, for, for a lot of different things, for computation, for performance and sample size requirements. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. I know everybody is probably very Zoom fatigued, so I appreciate you showing up and happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Anna. Um, that was a really excellent talk and uh, very interesting. Um,